Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining again. Uh, we're going to talk about aortic regurgitation today. So the third and sort of the four valvular topics that we've got going on this month. So we've gone through aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis. We'll talk about aortic regurgitation this week and then mitral regurgitation next week. And then we might get onto a few more sort of hemodynamic things. All right, so aortic regurgitation, pretty common. So 80% of patients with some form of aortic stenosis have some degree of aortic regurgitation. And that statement, the next thing we've obviously got to say is that the aortic regurgitation, if it is significant, can make you overestimate the severity of the aortic stenosis. Because of course, if you've got more blood coming back, you're gonna have more blood going forward. And so you must take that into consideration when you're assessing the severity of aortic stenosis. So that's where things like the dimensionless severity index for aortic stenosis is so important. And you can't rely on just the mean gradient or just the Vmax. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, 2% of young subjects have some form of aortic regurg, which we've also seen as little traces. And 7% of middle-aged uh, also have some form of uh, aortic regurg. I think we've probably all, all seen that. And in terms of the etiology, uh, the majority are to the non-valvular, but the, the valvular are the ones that I think I see much more of, uh, which are the congenital, the endocarditis, rheumatic, miscellaneous. I think sort of the, the big ones are, uh, you know, also just the degenerative changes, because this is just from a study of patients that were having aortic valve replacements, obviously the more severe end of the spectrum. But the ones that we'd see most of would be sort of degenerative or the aortic stenosis type disease. Um, the ones that we love asking about in the exam, uh, you know, the aortic regurg is always a pretty common one for the exams because it's uh, a great one for talking about the acute versus chronic effects and also for having other pathologies such as for these guys, for the valvular ones, let's not forget the congenital one, the bicuspid aortic valve, often associated with um, aortic regurgitation, and we can see that's the most common congenital valve disease, obviously. The endocarditis, uh, as you know, looking for those eccentric jets, and the conversation along those in the exams are always along the line of, you know, you pick up the, ex uh, pick up the uh, endocarditis, you'll see it's got an eccentric jet, and that gives us a chance to take the conversation on to the advantages and disadvantages of each of the way of assessing severity. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail as we, as we continue. The other side of things, talking about any kind of aortopathies, and they can be associated with aortic regurg. So dissection flaps or just aneurysmal aortas like we've got in this, in this picture here that grabbed from somewhere, and the aortitis, all of those can be associated with severe AR. It can often be eccentric. We've got to use all the modalities that we can to assess the valvular severity, just the same as we do with when we spoke about aortic stenosis and aortic regurg. So I can use the term again, and I think it's third week running, the idea of see the whole heart. And that means that if you've got a valvular uh, anomaly that you think is significant, you must go and look at the rest of the heart. So in the example of aortic regurgitation, if first of all, let's talk about the history and the shortness of breath, or taking some form of assessment of what you think the severity might be if it was associated with the regurg. You know, if someone's short, short of breath, with acute AR, you know, something will have happened such as a dissection flap or, you know, is it, uh, you know, a valvular abnormality an acute sort of rupture of a, uh, of a valve or endocarditis or something like that versus a more insidious onset suggesting a more chronic process. And with the more chronic process, you get this sort of LV volume overloaded process where you get the hypertrophy, the dilated LV, you get the dilated annulus causing that central mitral regurgitation that can be significant. Uh, with that volume overload of the LV, you're going to have diastolic dysfunction and raised uh, filling pressures or left ventricle end diastolic pressure. So looking at E to E prime, looking at the E to A wave, looking at the size of the left atrium. Uh, and particularly the more signs of chronic, uh, well, let me ask, when we get to the end and then we'll have a chat about acute versus chronic. So just have a think about what you think of those features might be acute and which feature of those do you think might be chronic? And we'll talk about that. 
So let's just go through in the standard way. 2D, talk about color Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, and continuous wave Doppler. We'll talk about acute versus chronic, and then we'll do a case. So the same way with all the valves, let's start off with the 2D features. So start off by looking at the aortic valve and trying to get an idea, do they have that beautiful opening, uh, thin, sort of symmetrical opening like we see in a normal echo exam, or do we have something that either looks degenerative or thickened? Uh, is there any kind of sort of aortic stenosis, which then can be associated with regurg? Or do you have any obvious 2D abnormalities such as we can see in here? I don't know how, I don't know, if, I hope you can see that, but it, it's not super easy. Uh, but can you see that there's some form of, it looks like a prolapsed uh, leaflet that's actually coming into the LVOT. And if you have some form of 2D abnormality that looks like that, you've got to be going with the idea that we've got some form of significant, you know, at least moderate uh, aortic regurgitation going on. And we've got to have our thoughts on of assessing this in multiple different ways. So after we've looked at the actual valve and how it moves, we have to idea, do the cusps close properly? If you've got some form of dilation and the cusps don't even sort of close together, again, that would point towards some severity. I talk about the reverse doming of the anterior mitral valve, and I guess you could probably add in the Austin Flint murmur with a fluttering of the aortic, uh, uh, sorry, of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Uh, and I think that's probably in the bonus point mark. Uh, I think the first thing to be talking about is just do the valve leaflets look like they open okay? Do they coapt okay? Is there any kind of obvious prolapse or abnormality? And maybe we get into that. Don't forget about the in the parasternal long axis view that uh, the aortic valve is kind of dome out as they're opening like that for the bicuspid valve. You know, normal valve opens like that. The uh, bicuspid valve tends to have that sort of concave appearance to it if you can see my hands if uh, so i'm doing a echo through interpretive dance as always so yeah normal opens up like that echo open uh, uh, the bicuspid aortic valve has a bit of a curved picture to it after the valve let's not forget to look at the rest of the heart lv size lv hypertrophy left atrial size and the idea being if you've got a big left atrium there's at least some form of subacute process going on with raised left ventricle and diastolic pressures. So, Danielle, poor thing, you're always at the top of the list, aren't you? Um, give us the limitations to some of these. So what, what are the problems with trying to base severity of a valvular lesion based on 2D? So I suppose um, the limitations related to transthoracic echo are really the limitations of um, image quality, yep. uh, which might be impaired by body habitus or difficulty positioning the patient. Um, and so the valve may be better interrogated using transesophageal echo. Nice, yeah, okay, so image quality, yep. Um, if the valve annulus is very calcified, um, then it may be difficult to actually see the valve leaflets. Nice. So it might be a limitation. Yeah. Uh, and again, we're talking about trying to estimate severity. Well, I mean, the severity of a regurgitant um, lesion is really based on the flow, and you don't get much information about the flow just from 2D findings without looking at colour or spectral wave Doppler. Yeah. Um, and I guess if we're talking about acute versus chronic? Well, uh, I mean... <sighs> It, there are some features that would be more consistent with an acute pathology. You know, if you see a dissection flap, then you're probably going to and yes. presented in an acute yep. fashion. You're going to assume the problem's acute. Yep. Uh, if there is dilatation of the LV, it's more likely to be chronic. Um, yep. But you could have. Um, uh, you don't know which which problem is um, primary and which is secondary. Um, so you might have chronic dilatation of the aortic root um, along with the dilated cardiomyopathy and that might result in aortic regurgitation. Um, but either way, dilatation tends to suggest chronicity. Yeah, very nice. Yep, that sounds good. Okay, so after 2D Doppler and the limitations we just mentioned, let's talk about color Doppler. So uh, I think first of all, in our parasternal long axis view, you can see here when we've got this marked abnormality of that aortic valve lesion with a prolapsing mitral valve leaflet, prolapsing aortic valve leaflet, excuse me. We've got this quite eccentric looking 
jet that comes out and sort of pointing down towards that anterior mitral valve leaflet. And I guess this would be an unusual one to, to talk about sort of two of the common things that we can use with color Doppler. So the two main things we can use to try and assess severity with color Doppler is first of all, we look at the jet height. So that's the difference between the LVOT height and the, uh, the aortic regard jet height. Mild, less than 25%. Uh, it's always sixes for this, so greater than 60% can be associated with severe regurgitation. And then the other one is the uh, is the old is my old favourite the vena contractor, which is a quite simple one to do. You sort of need a central regurgitation jet, and you're looking to find that narrowest point before uh, as it comes out of the orifice. You often get that narrowest point before it then branches out, and so you try and find that, and you can measure the 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 size of that. Less than three millimeters. And forgive me, I forgot to put in the, the the units there. So we're taking about less than three millimeters is mild, and greater than six millimeters is severe. So Lee, you're next on the traps, man. So I, so we just talked about color Doppler trying to estimate severity of aortic regurgitation. What do you think of the limitations with the the definitions that I've just given to you there? And particularly, maybe of relevance to the critically ill. Uh, Do you want to start with the jet height? So, let's talk about. Do you reckon you could use jet height in this case here, where we've got eccentric regurgitation? What do you think about that? Well, if we couldn't get the uh, the plane in the right angle to measure the height, we'd end up overestimated by going through the. the Very nice. And so if you can imagine if I measured that, that the jet is going at sort of this 45 degree angle, I would be measuring it in an obtuse thing. So you're absolutely right. I could overestimate how much of that is filling the LVOT because I'm simply not at sort of a parallel junction measuring it from where the regurgitation should be going. So it's the, the jet height is really sort of only good with sort of central aortic regurgitation. Um, otherwise, you have the potential to overestimate it. Nice. And um, what else do you think about, let's say, particularly with the critically ill, what do you think uh, about some of these cutoffs? Uh, I don't know. It's the short answer. So in the critically ill, whenever answers that, remember, we're dealing with hemodynamically unstable patients. So particularly people who are going to be have either, you know, like a septic cardiomyopathy and have a hyperactive circulation so they can have cardiac outputs of, you know, over six liters, so you can have like six, eight, nine liters of cardiac output, in which case we could say that anything to do with color Doppler is always going to be load dependent. So if you've got a truckload of blood around, you can make regurgitation lesions or stenotic lesions look much worse because you've got more blood going around. Um, same as if they're fluid overloaded, you know, more volume going around, you can make lesions look worse. But what also do you think about the settings? Can you know anything about the settings? Have you done your part one yet? Have you done the physics? Uh, yes, I did the physics. Please, please. So tell me about the settings that we could have for color Doppler. So what, what, what's, uh, what, what settings do you have for color Doppler? What's the one that I've uh, slightly irritatingly managed to uh, take off this image that should be on the right up here? Uh, where you are baseline set and the, the degree of velocity that you're measuring. Yeah, beautiful, the scale. So the, the big one for me are the scale and the gain. Because I can make someone who's got mild AR look like they've got severe AR if I turn the scale way, way down and I turn the gain way up. So that means that it would be picking, it'd be much more sensitive, it would pick up much more blood flow going on. And if I turn the gain up, you can make anything mild look severe. So it's just, it is dependent on the settings. I'd also say that it's dependent on good imaging. I think my imaging here where I've, for some reason, filled the entire 2D image with the color box is not appropriate. It should just be covering what I'm interested in. So making sure you've got an adequate sector width so that you get good temporal resolution. Make sure you've got uh, the scale right and make sure you've got the gain right. Nice. And um, while I've got you there, what do you think, bearing that in mind, about the vena contractor? So have you, have you ever measured the vena contractor? Uh, have I ever measured it? Yeah. <laughs> well, have a crack at it. 
and um, maybe we'll talk through a little bit. So what do you think about the ability of Echo to tell the difference between three versus six millimeters, which is the cutoff from mild to severe? Imagine trying to measure it in this one here, pretending maybe my imaging isn't completely god awful, but can you imagine trying to try and measure that vena contractor there? No. It would be hard, right? You've got to pause it and you've got to find it at the right phase when you've got a, sort of the, big, the best demarcation of it. And then you've got to try and measure that beautiful vena contractor. And if you can do it and often you need a central regurgitation jet, it, it's quite useful. I just find anything in echo where the difference between mild to severe is three millimeters, like, you know, like measuring an RV free wall and trying to tell the difference between chronic and acute, uh, you know, RV pressure overload, I think is, is fraught with danger. So I do make this measurement, uh, particularly if it's sort of more of the severe end of the category, but it's not always easy to make those very delicate measurements in, uh, in critically ill patients, I find. Um, that's a good, yeah. question. good question. With the jet pipe, so what phase are you checking it? Do you check mm. it at the end diastole? Yeah, I do normally check it uh, as in, in the middle of diastole, actually, middle. as I'm doing yeah. it. Okay. And yeah. with the vena contractor, at what level? Where you've got the best demarcation. So it's, uh, maybe I can show it, I think I've got it on the next slide. So here we go, you measure it at that sort of the narrowest point after it comes okay. through the, the, the valve. So if you imagine, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but probably the coaptation point is up there and the vena contractor is just distal to, to that. And, you know, and there's sort of, you know, two, six or seven, you know, six being the cutoff between the moderate and the severe. And 14 is definitely severe. Um, why don't we go, uh, Lewis, let's talk about this next one for you, if that's all right. So Lewis McLean. So here we're going to talk now about the pressure half time. So after we've done color wave Doppler with its limitations based on imaging and settings in particular, then we can come on to continuous wave Doppler. So what views can we do continuous wave Doppler through the aortic valve on TTE? So TT, so preferably you'd have a an alignment to blood flow, and you'd have nice. good alignment to the uh, LVOT and um, aortic root. So preferably a pull five chamber, and or oh, three chamber. Three. So we've got two sort of bites of the cherry. We've got the apical five and the apical three chamber, and if we've got anything like moderate or above, try and assess them in both. And we're looking to try and find the most clearly demarcated regurgitation jet. Um, so we go for something called the pressure half time. Do you remember what the cutoffs are for mild and severe? So less than what for mild and greater than what for severe? Uh, so this doesn't follow the rule of sixes, unfortunately. No, it doesn't, um, does it? Sorry, yeah. Cut off for, so severe is 200, yep. less than 200 uh, milliseconds. and mild is greater than 500. Fantastic, well done. And that's because the pressure equilibration happens quicker if it's severe, obviously. Yeah, so you imagine if you've got a truckload of blood just pouring into the left ventricle, the pressure would build up faster, which means that that flow, which is instead of saying quite high, you know, like three, four meters a second, would drop off very quickly as the pressure in the left ventricle fills. Uh, and that brings on to maybe a sign of severity, which we call the cutoff sign. So if you've got really severe aortic regurgitation, particularly acute severe aortic regurgitation, you get what's known as a cutoff sign, where you get rapid equalization of pressures between the aortic root and the LV. So here where we have that kind of sort of, uh, maybe I'll say here, where we've got the classic sort of up to the top, and then it goes, you know, and you get that kind of, it's almost like a U shape or whatever, a V shape. O over in the severe ones, if you get the very sharp and then a triangular drop down, so it sort of goes up and then straight down, that's called the cutoff sign. Rapid equalization of pressures associated with severe aortic regurgitation. All right. And then the last one to talk about, which is probably more pulsed wave Doppler rather than anything else, is talking about the size of the LVOT. The more severe the uh, regurgitation, the aortic regurgitation, the larger the LVOT VTI will be. Um, so we mentioned this very briefly. Ben, I've got Ben Gahadi. Hi. Um, so Ben, if you're up for a quick question, I know you're just starting off doing this stuff, but we mentioned you were here when we talk about aortic stenosis and we talked about how to assess that with things like the mean gradient and the Vmax. 
what are they, we, we mentioned it briefly, what, if I've got a severe regurgitation like I've got here and I've got an LVOT VTI of 36, can you just talk to me how you would then put that into context with aortic stenosis if you're worried about that being there? Uh, it sounds like a very simple yet challenging question to me at least. Um, well, the idea is about blood flow, right? So the VTI yeah, yeah. is all about stroke volume. So yeah. if I've got a normal VTI, which is around about, say, 18 to 22, if we take that one as being a normal stroke volume, and then suddenly I go to severe AR and I chuck in a whole bunch of blood, what does it do to your stroke volume? So your stroke volume should increase because you've got to go to filling. Fantastic. And so we talked about it with aortic stenosis, that things like um, if you've got a mean gradient where you, you find aortic, a continuous wave Doppler, you get that kind of parabolic flow of aortic, uh, aortic stenosis, yep. and you can trace it out. You can get a mean gradient, and you can find out also what the maximum gradient is. And if I told you that it was greater than, the mean gradient was greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, or the maximum gradient was greater than four, that would indicate someone with severe aortic stenosis. Yep. But let's say I give that the same case, but then we check in aortic regurgitation. What's the problem with those measures then? So, I mean, I'm sure I used the wrong words, but right. you've effectively got, you're, you're starting with an overfull left ventricle in a way. So as a consequence to that, your gradients will be distorted because you'll have, um, you'll start with a greater pressure differential between the left ventricle and the aortic group. Right. So, so if I had a pressure gradient that was say 50 with mm -hmm. severe aortic regurgitation. The severe AR can be overcalling your aortic but that's, but that's it. So if you've got severe AR, you're going to overestimate the severity of your aortic stenosis. Yep. And so that's where things like trying to compare your LVOT VTI with the VTI of your aortic valve, what's known as the dimensionless severity index. And yep. the whole point about that is it's dimensionless because you're just comparing sort of two hopefully relatively similar value, uh, two similar sort of num parameters being measured. It gives you a chance to maybe have the best sort of load independent measure. Yep. So talking about the, the, the classic buzzwords we use for the exams, talking about things being load dependent or load independent and things like that color wave, or, you know, things like this color, uh, color Doppler, these are load dependent, as in the more blood you got going around, the worse they can look. Yep. Things like the dimensionless severity index comparing VTIs is load, is more load independent because yep. we're taking the situation, we're taking the sort of the blood volume out of the equation. Nice. Okay, now my favorite bit, where are we up to? Um, Oh, I wish I hadn't put that in there. Benny, do you, I know you know all this, but do you want to tell people about this, Benny, just to get you involved? Um, hi, by the way, how's it all going being a mum? Hi, good. Fantastic. Is he there? Is he with us? Yeah, he's there. Um... Maybe we should ask Jasper. Jasper, <laughs> tell us what this one is. He'll, uh, he'll know by the time he's three. We'll let him, we'll let him have a couple more years. He's, only, he's, he's not even one yet, but I expect him to know this by his fourth birthday. Yeah. What do we, let's just take me, uh, first of all, give me the, the top one. So just for everyone's knowledge, this is transthoracic echo. And imagine I'm imaging, uh, looking at sever uh, at severity of aortic, aortic regurg, and I'm doing a suprasternal view. What am I seeing here? What am I pointing to? Uh, so you're pointing to a diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, which uh, indicates, if it's hollow diastolic, it, it indicates a severe AR. Beautiful. So we can often get just a little sort of sh little blip that can come in with aortic regurgitation. Uh, but classically, obviously, blood should be flowing. So here, if blood is flowing towards the uh, towards the probe, we might be in the uh, we're probably in the ascending aorta here at the moment. So looking at blood coming back up because blood's coming towards the probe. And then this one below it is blood flowing away from it. So you can measure blood flow in the aorta. In two places, really, we can have it in sort of the arch around the ascending aorta, or you can have it in the descending aorta down in the tummy. So, if you're in measuring it in the arch, the classic things I think they say in the guideline is you've got to have for severe AR, you have hollow diastolic flow reversal, as in diastole, which is when the aortic valve is meant to be closed, you've got a bloody great hole, loads of blood flowing through, which means that you get weird blood flow going back the wrong way down the aorta. 
so severe aortic regurgitation, and it's hollow diastolic, and if you are measuring it in the sort of around the arch region, the end diastolic gradient, so like, like that little point just there, should be greater than 20 centimeters a second, just, just being specific, if you're going for the golden points. That would be associated with severe AR. If you're in the descending aorta, any sort of kind of hollow diastolic flow reversal is suggestive of severe AR. Okay, so that's hollow diastolic flow reversal in the aorta is associated with a significant aortic regurg. Uh, how about Hatim? What do I ask you about the? And what am I trying to demonstrate here in the bottom one? And this is continuous wave Doppler. I'm sorry, I kind of messed up. This is not pulse wave Doppler. This is continuous wave Doppler. But what is that? So it's the... So trans I'll give you a clue. It's the transthoracic... Trans uh, uh, apical... Uh, apical 4. Apical four and I'm showing mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation. So it's, again, the, the earlier phase of the mitral regurgitation is actually showing mixed flow, which more likely coming across from the aortic valve and showing an earlier... Uh, regurgitant lesion, uh, some regurgitant, almost, 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 and it'd be better, I could probably find a better picture than this. Let me say, what, what if I told you if there was a P wave there, then the QRS here, and then the T wave there? So this so is this associated a, with the a, atrial contraction. Atrial contraction. So this would be, uh, so during the atrial contraction, which reflects uh, reversal of the flow. Yeah, the fantastic, because it should be going the other way, right, with atrial yeah. contraction. Yeah. So what does that tell you? If you've got reversal of flow, when it should, the atrium should be contracting so and pushing blood out, it's going the wrong way. Yeah, so this means that there is a left ventricular volume overload leading to the reversal of the Beautiful. Flow. And so this is what's known as diastolic mitral regurgitation. And it's uh, as long as the patient's in sinus rhythm, it's often associated with severe raise left ventricular and diastolic pressure and aortic regurg, severe aortic regurg, very nice. Okay, uh, where are we back to? Louise, do you want to take this one? So which of the following is not a sign of severe aortic regurgitation? We've got diastolic MR, hollow diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, a pressure half time of 100 milliseconds, jet width of 80%, uh, or a mean transaortic valve gradient of 45 millimeters of mercury? Yeah, fantastic. It's a bit of a crap question. But you get the uh, get idea. Beautiful, well done. So that would be a sign of what? A mean transaortic valve gradient of 45. Stenosis. It could be a sign of significant stenosis. Maybe. And maybe. Yeah. If there was AR, we could potentially be overcalling it. Very nice. So here's just uh, the standard. Um, I think there might be a more recent version of this. I'm sorry, I've only got it from 2003, but uh, freely available on, on Google. Amazing uh, recommendations by the American Society. I think the newest one is the American Society and the Europeans talking about native valvular regurgitation. And these are the bog standard ones. You'd be expected to, excuse me, you'd be expected to be able to come out with these in the exam. Maybe not the regurgitation volume or the estimate orifice areas, but you'd be expected to know uh, I think you'd expect to know the pressure half time signs from acute versus chronic. Some idea of all the different measures, but if you didn't know the vena contractor cutoffs, I'd be okay with it. But at least I'd like to expect you to know how to do it, how to image it, and what are the pitfalls with doing it. And the same with the uh, central jet versus LVOT diameter. So, just as we've been through how to measure it, what are the pitfalls with all of them? Okay, uh, Danielle, do you want to go this one? So I've got a 60 year old man, he's just sort of quick point and shoot. And this is kind of the way that it would be in the exam. We'll go through a case in a moment in a bit more depth, but in the exam, it would be along these kind of lines. So you'd only have, you know, maybe six or so, you know, four, three to six slides. So we give you a little stem like this. So you've got a 60 year old man, chest pain, shortness of breath, wide and medium standing on the chest x ray. What do you see? This is an apical five chamber view. Uh, the grayscale image shows a extremely dilated proximal aortic root and the um, color Doppler image shows severe aortic regurgitation. Um, in combination with the clinical presentation, this man has an aortic dissection until proved otherwise. Very nice. Um, tell me about the uh, signs of it. Is it acute or chronic? Uh, I expect it's acute um, because of the presentation. Um, uh, 
but that's about all I can really say based on the yeah, I mean, I think we could also the dilated talk. aortic root. You can't be sure. You don't know whether that's acute or chronic. That's very nice. Um, it could be that it was a chronic process which has suddenly dissected and now led to an acute presentation. The left ventricle does look like it could be dilated. Yeah, hypertrophy. So that would go along with, with some element of a chronic yeah. pathology. Well, but I think that's five centimetres there. So I think we're probably at least six and a half centimetres maybe. Probably good going hypertrophy. And just, yeah, as you said, mentioning some signs of maybe this is a, there's some chronic kind of LV dilation going on there. So I probably also good. mentioned I can't see a dissection flap, but you couldn't exclude aortic dissection on a transthoracic echo. And you can see the descending aorta there quite prominently as well. So that mm -hmm. may also be dilated. But again, I can't see a dissection flap within it. Very nice. Yeah, yeah I think it's probably a small pericardial small effusion pericardial pericardial sitting in there. Yeah, yep, yeah. agreed. And well picked up because some people have obviously mistaken that for the right atrium. So yeah. well picked up and the colour does help sort of directing the right thing. Okay, so what about this? Uh, still me? Go for it. Yeah, I'll let you do the whole thing. Okay. Um, so the, um, this is a, um, a continuous wave um, spectral Doppler trace. And you can see that the regurgitant jet density um, is very dense. It is almost nice. equal to the um, forward flow jet very that's nice. consistent with severe aortic regurgitation. And the pressure half time is less than 200, also consistent with severe. Um, I'm looking to see if I'd say it's an early cutoff. I'm not sure if I'd say it's early cutoff necessarily, but it's a steep pressure half time. Yeah. Now, you've been very, very nice about the imaging. So you're allowed to bag it out. So just going to pick up on a few things that you said. So first of all, you said that uh, you've got a dense, dense trace. And absolutely, I'm sorry I didn't mention that. So with continuous wave Doppler, the more blood you got flying around, obviously the denser the, the, the bit in the middle of the profile is going to be. And you compared it to the stuff that's going forward, which is really nice. I think rather than using the term severe, I think you term significant just to be careful with a crisp thing, a crisp language, because... Uh, you know, I think it's a very non-sensitive sign. It's like the other two 2D signs are non-sensitive. I think we just say it's significant uh, amount of blood flow going on, so significant aortic regurg. Okay. And the next thing it says, what about these measurements? I mean, so you, you, again, you're taking these numbers as gospel, yeah. and I'd argue that they've been fudged a little bit. And they've been fudged a little bit because this trace is a bit rubbish. I think on the previous image, blood flow is sort of going off at almost like a 40 degree angle here. And if anything, it's quite complex in nature. And looking at this one, I, I suggest maybe we're not exactly on angle. And that's been picked up by again, the, where I'm making this measurement, I could have made it probably in about, I could have changed it either way a fair amount. And if you look at this first and the second profile, you know, I don't even know where to, where to go. I think we could talk about the optimization of the image. How would you how would you optimize that image if you had a chance to to be there well, holding, a, the, holding a button? The scale on the spectral Doppler should be increased nice. so that the actual profiles are taking up a greater proportion of the screen. Yep. And if you're wanting to examine specifically the regurgitant jet, then the baseline should be lowered yep. um, in order to maximize the size of the regurgitant jet profile. Beautiful. And sweep speed? Um, should be uh, reduced so that um, three cardiac cycles are contained okay. on the screen. So I think you're probably right, uh, but it was just uh, those numbers. I think it's reasonable to say that, you know, based on those numbers, it looks severe. Based on, uh, because it's less than 200, uh, the pressure half times less than 200. Based on the colour density, it suggests it's significant. Uh, however, the imaging is is slightly suboptimal, and I'll be wanting to assess this in conjunction with other parameters. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what other parameters would you like to see? So I would like to actually get a um, further 2D examination, particularly nice. looking at the parasternal long axis views um, and suprasternal views of the aortic root itself, nice. um, looking for the cause of the pathology, like a dissection flap, as I said. Uh, and also, you know, I, I mean, of course you would do a full study so that would also include subcostal views looking for um, a pericardial effusion and the like. Um, I would also like 
to see, examine the effect on the mitral valve. So you'd be looking for, you know, fluttering mitral valve and that sort of supportive evidence. Um, and you want to examine um, the ascending and descending aorta for, um, for diastolic flow reversal. Beautiful. And the last thing to add in is maybe assessing it in a three chamber view, multiple angles, going yeah. off axis maybe to see if you could make the Doppler profile a little crisper. Yeah. Very nice. I wouldn't muck around for too long, though, honestly, because this man probably needs to go somewhere that he can have surgery. <laughs> what a great comment. That's nice. And I think maybe that's quite, uh, that's a really great thing to say in the exam. Don't forget to mention in the written exam uh, the importance of clinical context and often doing simultaneous echo assessment with resuscitation. You know, there's obviously something grossly wrong that's going on here and we've got to, and we've got to deal with it. So these are not, again, the best pictures. Uh, why don't you tell me what you see up at the top two pictures? So I think these are transesophageal echo pictures now. And I think what we're looking at is a, a long axis, midesophageal long axis view um, zoomed onto the aortic um, valve and LBOT. Beautiful. Uh, and can you see a dissection flap? Yes, I think I can. Yep. Interesting, interesting. Because this guy ended up not having a dissection flap. Okay, so that could be artifactual. Yeah, nice. Um, so and, and tell the difference. that you say that because in the um, view on the right hand side of the screen where there's color Doppler, you actually can see flow filling the entire what I think is the proximal aortic route. Excellent. If Excellent. there was actually a dissection flap there, then that's not what you would expect to see. Fantastic, very nicely done. So, first of all, so for artifact versus real structure and probably and uh, uh, dissection flaps are probably the biggest one to get it right in. So we say that colour goes over the valve, suggests colour goes over the area we thought there was a flap, so that suggests it's an artefact. Give me other things that, how you could tell artefact versus real structure. Um, so on this image, the artefact isn't, the, the what looks like a dissection flap isn't there on every image. Yeah. Um, no. It's not very very consistent and you can't see the distal end of where the flap is. Um, yeah. So in order to determine whether this is a real finding or an artifactual finding, you would need to examine it from multiple angles. You Good would job. see it in multiple orthogonal planes and from multiple viewpoints. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another clue that something is an artifact rather than a true structure is that um, you expect the structure to actually have the characteristics of, of what you think it is. Um, so you would want to see a dissection flap extending up into the um, up into the aortic arch, and you would want to try to follow up follow it in the suprasternal view, for example, to see whether it's involving you know the great vessels of the neck and that sort of thing. Right. Um, that would support the theory that it's a real structure. Nice. Anything else? Uh, well, otherwise, whether it, whether the structure has characteristics typical of an artifact, I'm not sure exactly what sort of artifact this is, to be honest. Because side I don't lobe know artifact. The question: Whether it's reverberation artifact. I, I think it's a side uh, lobe artifact, possibly associated with the intraatrial septum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nice. So um, again, it's a pretty common question for the exam, and just practice, just rolling off a few other things, and everything you said is correct. Um, so you talked about colour, colour Doppler overlying it. You talked about needing multiple angles. You talked about assessing other two-dimensional areas to see if you could explain it as a real structure. Just the things that you missed out that, again, easy marks, changing the depth, yeah. zooming in on the structure that you're worried about, because if you zoom in on it, you don't get the other areas being imaged as well. And if it goes away, it's obviously an artefact using M mode, so sticking an M mode down through there. M mode, again, it's just a single line of ultrasound beam. If it's a real structure, you'll see something there. Uh, can you explain it by the physics? You know, can you say that this is a side lobe or a reverberation or a mirror artifact? Does it move sort of in concert with other areas of the heart, whereas something like a dissection flap would have some form of independent motion? Uh, and so those are the other ones just to Make sure they sort of roll off the tongue. I just practice those. And then just while I got you on there, what, what are we showing at the bottom here then? It's that hollow diastolic flow reversal. In very nice. And I'm imaging in the aorta descending aorta. aorta here. Descending aorta. Yeah, very nice. So here we've got blood flow away during systole. And this is diastole, hollow diastolic flow reversal, and the end diastolic parameters at least 0.2. So that's suggesting severe. Cool. 
All right, we'll just do a quick case. We've got two minutes. So conclusion, I guess aortic pathology, aortic regurg is common. Uh, echo, obviously, is, is going to be a great thing to try and assess it. Assess it from lots of different angles. Parasternal long, apical five and apical three in particular, I find useful. Uh, and use all the information you can. So both 2D, color Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, and, con and continuous wave Doppler, um, as well as history and examination findings. We'll talk about the quantifications important for definitely for lesions that are at least moderate or above. And taking clinical assessment into that scenario. All right. Hatim, do you want to take the case? Yep. All right, we'll just spend five minutes just going through this case. This is an oldie. If ever you've attended any, any of my courses ever, you know I'll pull this one out because I think there's a lot of great learning opportunities for this. So forgive me if you've already seen this once before. 77-year-old female, she had a non-STEMI with a history of a bioprosthetic aortic valve. She uh, unfortunately developed cardiogenic shock during her angioplasty, which was sort of like two days later. She was relatively stable before that. And during that, they discovered that she had some left main and circumflex disease, and they put in a drug eluting stent. Um, she was intubated during the procedure, inotropes were started, and she was put in uh, an intraaortic balloon pump was put in. Progressive escalation in inotropes over the next four hours. And this probably would not be in the exam, but it's very clinically relevant. So this is a picture that we took at the time of her ECG along with her uh, blood sort of flows. I'm just gonna leave that and we'll come back to it if obviously it's not part of it. Let's have a look at this. Okay, so this uh, personal of access uh, you showing uh, calcified uh, aortic valve or the prosthetic valve as well as left ventricular hypertrophy is normal LV uh, function and relatively normal, uh, relatively normal function and normal size of the LV. Nice. Uh, and the LV and the systolic function? Systolic function uh, appears to be to be okay. We've taken uh, left and thicker walls, so probably there could be an end of uh, dysfunction. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, anterior mitral valve leak looks taken as well. Nice, all right. And what did you say? Just can you run me through the aortic valve again. So the, through the aortic valve, uh, so there's a history of uh, a prosthetic valve. Yep. It's, it's, it looks. Uh, Bioprosthetic or metallic? Uh, I'm not sure, but it looks metallic more likely. Okay, it's actually so sort of bioprosthetic, that's one thing. Because we can see those leaflets quite readily, I think, and there's not a huge amount of shedding. It's a bit hard, I agree. Look, we're looking for horrible artifact behind it, and to be fair, I think it's a bit of, bit of uh, post-acoustic shadowing there. Yep, anything else? Uh, your look, looks... Stick with the valve with me just for a with second. With the valve itself, but it just... Look thickened. Yeah, it's very thickened, absolutely. Yep. Yep. And the big thing that I'm also looking at is in terms of the 2D morphology. Can you see that there's a part of this valve that is prolapsing yes, in, prolapsing. and even with independent motion in there? Yes. And this is a lady who doesn't have infective endocarditis, right? She yes. was well, she just came in for a non STEMI. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an awful lot of information we can get out of that because what do you think the severity of the aortic regurgitation? would be, uh, obviously this is about regurgitation, I'm going to show it, it to you. would be at least more than this would be. Nice, so we've got significant 2D anatomical abnormalities, which would suggest that the regurgitation would be significant. So now what do you think of the fact that she's got, you know, this lady was in cardiogenic shock. I mean, what, I don't know, I wasn't expecting this when we started doing imaging on this patient. So, uh, except if there is significant aortic regurgitation, there is no enough explanation from this aspect. Fantastic. So straight away, I think there should be alarm bells ringing that a patient in aortic, uh, in cardiogenic shock with an aortic balloon pump in has a normal left ventricle function. Uh, and obviously an aortic balloon pump is a contraindication for some form of aortic regurgitation. Yep. Beautiful. Uh, just in time, I'm gonna flick through to the good bits. So here we can see, excuse me, here you can see the zoomed in view of the aortic valve. You can probably see it a bit more clearly. There's something that's flapping there into the LVOT. 
So this a color Doppler across the both mitral and aortic valves, and uh, uh, there is a clear eccentric jet uh, out of the of the aortic valve. Uh, consistent with aortic regurg, properly it would be at least moderate to severe. Yeah, nice. And how are you telling it's moderate or severe? So with the width of yeah. the of the of the jet, it would be at least like sixty percent. Yeah, very nice. Uh, so we just uh, we've got a little bit of raised pulmonary pressures there. We've got a reduced pulmonary acceleration time less than ninety milliseconds. If this is in the pulmonary valve, uh, suggesting we've got some form of raised pulmonary vascular resistance. Again, normal LV size, normal LV function, no rip roaring, acute regional wall motion abnormalities, which again is a little odd given this patient is in cardiogenic shock. So this is an evical four chamber view. Uh, showing mild uh, dilatation. Uh, but maybe. maybe. Yeah. Just well, remember that's line. that's five centimeters. I have six as being so looking at the side there. So six centimeters would be dilated for me. I, I don't reckon that's I don't reckon that's dilated. Yep. Yep. Otherwise, again confirming the normal LV function, uh, and uh, I think ejection fraction is showing here to be nearly seventy percent. Mm, nice. Yeah, evical two chamber. Uh, Can we just stick on, the, stick on the apical four? Tell me about the what's this down here? Where about? Uh, sorry, the left edge. Yep. Tell me about left. This. left atrium is mild dilated. Yeah, okay, so normally I'd say the left atrium is about 25 to 30 percent the size of the left ventricle. That would yep. be mildly dilated. Yep. Yeah, so normal is about 25 percent. I think that that's almost the bloody same dimension as that. I mm. think it's the sign of a severely dilated left atrium. Mm. And what do you think about the intraatrial septum? Intraatrial septum is pushed to the left, to the right side, yeah, which nice. is reflecting the increased pressure. Increased Fantastic. Pressure. So that we, at least we know that there's some form of chronically elevated left ventricle and diastolic pressures, um, but certainly we've got raised left ventricle and diastolic pressures now with increased left atrial pressure. Nice. So this color Doppler across the mitral valve and uh, showing a trace of mitral regurg uh, and uh, taking uh, pulse wave Doppler across the mitral inflow uh, with the deceleration, deceleration time of 160 nearly. Uh, and again, having uh, continuous so, wave Doppler. And hang on, so what, is, what does this suggest? So, if, so this uh, would be trivial regurgitation. No, no, so no, so this isn't telling us about regurgitation, the E uh, and the A this, wave? The E and A is, are reversed, which are reflects. No, no, they're not reversed. They're, they're, so normally you'd have the E greater than the A. Yes. If they're around the other way, we get yep. the pseudo severe. So do, so do. But now we've got the E that is four to five times greater than the A. Greater than the A. So, this diastolic uh, dysfunction. Nice, and mild, moderate, severe. This would be at least moderate to severe. This is severe, so yeah. greater than two in the E to A ratio is suggestive of severe or restrictive yeah. LV so filling. Grade, grade it's, not, it's not perfect, it's obviously load dependent, but grade three, grade this three. Is, that is suggestive of severe diastolic dysfunction. Now take me down to this one down here. So We're this spend one a is continuous, continuous wave Doppler across the, uh, the mitral valve yep, as well. Yep. And this again showing the DVDT of average uh, 800. Yeah, and we talked a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about this next week. Yep. I kind of put this in the same ballpark as being a contractor, mm -hmm. that I reckon you can change the little angle to make it mild to severe is often a very small angle. So it's not my favorite measurement to make because it's super easy to get wrong. Yep. So I didn't put it up there because of the MRDPDT. Mm -hmm. This would suggest that the cardiac output is super low. It's, it's not, it's but, low. We, but you told me that the cardiac output is fine because you've seen the ejection fraction. So No, so ejection fraction is not just reflective of the, Very of, nice. the, of, the, of the cardiac output. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Very nice indeed. Um, so why else am I showing you that picture? What else? Talk to me, because you're worried about severe area. So right? th this would be again, reflective of the uh, how much of the effective flow of the mitral valve. Okay, okay. And don't get too caught up with the, M, the DPDT. It's not, it's not a great measure. Mm. So what else are you seeing on there? Look at the whole profile. So it's not the best profile because the... the the baseline is changed, but there is a hollow, there is a, a mitral, there is a diastolic mitral. Yeah, what the hell is this, man? It's yeah. going the wrong way. There yeah. should be, blood should be going the other way, right? Yes. Blood should be coming above the baseline during this process. So now that we've so got. So there's the regurge during the. Yeah, and what are we thinking about the regurge? So it's more likely reflective of aortic flow. Yeah, we've got some form of horrific restrictive filling of the left ventricle. We've got this 2D abnormality, that weird flap that was coming into the LVOT. And now we've got some diastolic MR. And this should all be adding up going, holy goodness, this is not good for someone who's on an intra-aortic balloon pump. Yes. So it's just uh, the idea that we've got diastolic MR restrictive filling, we're dealing with severe AR, that is absolutely a contraindication to, uh, to balloon pump. Okay, now what about this? So I've given you a pressure half time of 90 milliseconds. What do you okay, think about that? So this is consistent with, again, so first, the, the quality of the imaging. Nice, fantastic. What do you think about the quality of the So imaging? the quality is not the optimum. Second, that the, with the apical pipe chamber, the aortic valve or the LVOT is not opened appropriately. So it's not the true reflection of the of the true pressure. So it's we might be underestimating some things because we're not quite yeah. on yeah. on track. Yep. Yeah. And with that, uh, uh, it's again giving the cut off sign. Nice. Uh, with uh, so with acute the uh, deceleration of the flow across with the pressure across. So, and this would be a sign of uh, severe. Aortic Very aortic nice. Aortic. So just to summarize a little bit of what you said, you said that we were off axis a little bit, which I agree, maybe not perfectly aligned. It's not, it's not horrific, but it might not be perfect. I don't think we've got this beautiful, clear outline of the regurgitation, which is probably because we're off axis a little bit. So I'm with you. I, I don't think I'll trust this measurement. I think we probably could have done, you know, our imaging would have to look at it from other angles. But what we do see, which you picked up very nicely, was this cutoff sign. There is a period of time at the end of diastole before systole starts where there is no blood coming into the ventricle. And normally you do get blood coming into the ventricle right up and it's quite quick, that isovolumetric contraction time when you're looking at it in here. We are not seeing that here because we've got a cutoff sign. There's rapid right. equalization of that pressures, and this is a cutoff sign, again, uh, suggestive of severe aortic regurgitation. Um, don't worry about that, don't worry about that. This is a little harder. So this is, uh, again, beautiful attempt at trying to do suprasternal imaging and trying to look through the descending aorta. And this is meant to be blood flow away during systole. And it's this part above here is trying to look at the diastolic flow reversal. And it's not brilliant, but that's what we're trying to show here. And I think you can get the idea. There's a significant amount of blood during diastole, so we're going backwards the wrong way. So uh, we went on to do a toe on this patient, and I'd love to, if I can do this right, I'll show you what I mean. So I'm just pausing this top image. And if I can get it just right, you can see that we're still during diastole. Hang on, let's come back to this. Still during diastole, we'll still have some regurgitation that's coming. There, so we're not in systole yet, and we've still got some blood coming back towards the heart, and that is diastolic flow reversal so during flow diastole. Reversal. Okay, so again, it's a subtle sign, but it's quite specific for aortic regurgitation. And what we can see again is lots and lots of blood flow that's coming into that LVOT, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with regurgitation. And there's some form of weird valve something coming into the LVOT. And that's probably shown best. You can't see it brilliantly because of the bioprosthetic aortic valve, but there's a whole valve leaflet that is sort of floating back into the LVOT. And it's probably the non coronary cusp that's moving. So it's this non coronary cusp at the top. Okay. Hmm. Lovely picture with slightly off axis, but you get the idea that regurge and it fills that uh, LVOT during diastole again, suggestive of severe aortic regurge.
So I guess in conclusion, we made this is actually, you know, severe acute AR in there. There's evidence of severe leaflet disruption. The actual dehiscence isn't there, so it's well seated, but it is not functioning normally. But severe diastolic dysfunction with raised left ventricle and diastolic pressures. We've got some functional MR, we called it. I think it's a bit hard to tell when you've got so much blood coming back into the, uh, back into the left ventricle with some LA dilation, moderate pulmonary hypertension, normal RV size and function. Overall, severe acute valvular catastrophe. I think that's probably quite a nice word in this circumstance. With severe and hemodynamic significant aortic regurgitation, the intra-aortic balloon pump should be removed as soon as we can. And interestingly, if we just go back now to the very, very beginning, you know, this is where clinical context comes into it. You know, with an intraortic balloon pump, we should be seeing sort of augmented pressures and lower diastolic pressures for the augmented diastolic function. And we're not seeing any kind of nothing in there on the trace at all. So taking the clinical signs of cardiogenic shock with those initial echo images with this sort of all sort of points you in the right direction that you're dealing with severe, uh, severe AR. And this is the reason that it was eccentric. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Just which makes some of the values a bit harder to look at. Nicely done. Oh, sorry. Did they repeat any of the measures after they took the aortic balloon pump out or turned it off? No, it would have been great to do that. I'm afraid so we didn't do that because um, she became profoundly hemodynamically unstable, unfortunately, uh, uh, shortly after that. So, yeah, unfortunately. So, uh, we've, uh, yeah, none of these stories always, some, some of these don't really end very well, do they? Um, so unfortunately, no, she, she, we didn't get a lot of the post, uh, the post removal ones. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope that was useful. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, nice to see you guys. See you next week. Thank you very much. Bye.